everyone. I'm Donna Fiducia. And I'm Don Newen. And this is Cowboy Logic Radio. Cowboys didn't dance, didn't wear designer shirts. When their hearts were filled with memories, their bodies filled with hurt. They would sit around the campfire and exchange a piercing glare. Yeah. Back when the West was really wild, Cowboys didn't dance. Welcome to Cowboy Logic Radio, everyone. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Don Newen, and I would like to be the first to formally welcome you to tonight's riveting episode of Cowboy Logic Radio. Boy, have we got a big show for you. Donna, what are you doing? I'm looking for something, and I, I can't seem to find it. It's been over a year, and I can't seem to find the darn thing. What are you looking for? We're live right now. I'm looking for collusion. <laughs> But you can't find any collusion. (laughs) Not according to the House GOP Intel Committee. No collusion with the Trump campaign. Announced apparently, uh, well, just at the end of the day on Monday. (sighs) What does that mean, Donna? That means the investigative phase is over. But what does it mean? Oh, my. But what does it mean, Donna? It means that we just... Gotta find something. But but what I don't does know that what we mean? can find. If, if they have found no collusion, what exactly does that mean? It means Rod Rosenstein is still looking for something. And you're still looking. Yes, he's still looking. He says that uh, well, you know, even though Mueller is not an unguided missile, according to him, even though the House GOP Intel Committee has found no collusion. He says Mueller is not an unguided missile, and he offered unqualified support for Robert Mueller. <laughs> Gee, I wonder why. You don't think it's because Rosenstein is part of the deep state? Maybe. Yeah. So he has given Mueller that wide range to investigate. No restrictions, really, and it continues. At no the cost of collusion. What are we, like $40 million? The only thing, uh, the only person that's in deep doo-doo right now is James Clapper. No collusion. Collusion. Well, no collusion as far as the Trump campaign is concerned. However, you still have to worry about the dossier. You still have to worry about Uranium One. Comey apparently did some leaking. Remember, he admitted that after he said he didn't. So the big cheese still needs to be investigated, in my opinion. That would be one Hillary Clinton, who was in India on Monday or Sunday, whenever it was. I guess given the time difference, it must be Sunday. And she took that opportunity to basically do what she does. Well, She (laughs) fell down down. the steps afterwards, which I guess we shouldn't make fun of it. But she did, despite two men holding her up. She kind of fell down the steps and she threw off her shoes and walked barefooted. Because I guess it's easier to walk without her shoes. I bet that was attractive. Twice we've seen her lose her shoes and when she stumbles around. But yeah, she used that as usual to basically blast Donald Trump. (laughs) She's such a narcissist, isn't she? It's just really... Did she blame Trump for falling? No, she blamed Trump for I don't I guess her losing. I don't know. But she no did blame collusion. Trump. And then she said some stupid thing about women and empowering women, which is a total joke. And uh, <laughs> it was just dumb. It was dumb. And, and as a woman, you you can say that. See if I yes. said that, even though I'm Don Newen, somebody would find fault in me. Hillary Clinton, Miss Yeah. Uh, Bimbo gate or whatever it is, bimbo eruption gate. You cannot tell me you're for women. Sorry, you can't. By the way, Hillary Clinton's campaign paid less to the female staffers than the male staffers. Nobody talked about that. Did you? We know did. That? Yeah, we talked about that. Okay. So anyhow, she's a has been, and we'll get to uh, people who might be running this time around in just a minute. But uh oh, ladies and gentlemen, let me be the first to welcome you to tonight's riveting episode of Cowboy Logic Radio. Boy, have we got a big show for you. You know, speaking of campaigns, <laughs> I just ignore him. You notice that, folks? I just ignore him. You know, him when I'm going, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, we don't do this on, on uh, video or Facebook Live or anything like that. So you guys don't get, to, we don't. You don't get to see all of Donna's reactions to my stupidity and immature, <laughs> you know, level of behavior. Um, but what you but do when is I priceless. do that stuff, she just looks at me. Like, yeah. stop 
now. Yeah, no, but but you shake. You you shake and you shudder when you do I'm That's because it's not with. ranting, it's passion. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Talk about passion. Let's that's a good lead. That's an absolute great lead into what I'm about to talk about now. You want to talk about passion. You want to talk what about, you talking about Willis? a Donald What you talking about, Willis? A Donald Trump campaign stop. He is at his best when he is doing a campaign stop, and boy did he do one Saturday night outside Pittsburgh PA. It was priceless. And he talked about, you know, uh different things like possibly Rocket Man. But he was there to Push a guy named Rick Saccone, who is a Republican. He's been actually this guy Saccone running for uh, Congress. He sounds like a good Italian yeah, boy. Yeah, it looks like. Does a, he talk like Rocky? It looks like a gangster. Uh, you know that? No, I don't. No, he doesn't actually. <laughs> but he's close. But believe it or not, he was endorsed. Now this is a Republican. He was endorsed by the Pittsburgh Post Gazette, which is unheard of. From a major newspaper. Now, unfortunately, we're doing this show right now when all the results are coming in. But this is a Pittsburgh area, very important um, area, of course. And it's good if the Republicans can hold on to the seat. But you never know. And this guy, Lamb, who's running as a Democrat, he's a young, good looking kid, is distancing himself from Nancy Pelosi and the Democrat Party. So it's kind of interesting. In well, fact, he's you know, more aligning himself with one Trump. One of the greatest things that we've experienced um, in the past five years of doing this radio show, Donna, was back in uh, 2016, election night, when all of the endorsements were released. Endorphins, not endorsements. Endorse, yeah, endorsements. Oh, endorsements? That's, that's, okay. that's the feeling that you have. <laughs> When everybody votes and endorses your candidate, and you become victorious. Endorse fins. Yeah, they're okay. endorse fins. I get it. They're similar, to, like when you work out, and you release the endorse fins. Oh, okay. You yeah. burn calories, and you release endorse fins. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I thought fish You know what, ladies that. and gentlemen? I'm just thrilled that she got that. I sort of got Most it. of my jokes, she doesn't get. Well, I, st- I want to bring you all back to 1999. October 24th of 1999, when Donald Trump was a civilian, but he was very politically vocal. This is on Meet the Press with Tim Russert. May he rest in peace. But think about this, folks. He's talking about Kim Jong-il at the time. He's talking about North Korea. And this is October 24th, 1999, almost 20 years ago. You say that you, as president, would be willing to launch a preemptive strike against North Korea's nuclear capability? First, I'd negotiate. I would negotiate like crazy, and I'd make sure that we tried to get the best deal possible. Look, Tim, if a man walks up to you in a street in Washington, because this doesn't happen, of course, in New York, but if a man walks up and puts a gun to your head and says, give me your money, wouldn't you rather know where he's coming from before he had the gun in his hand? And these people, in three or four years, are going to be having nuclear weapons. They're going to have those weapons pointed all over the world and specifically at the United States. And wouldn't you be better off solving this really potentially unbelievable, and the biggest problem, I mean, we can talk about the economy, we can talk about social security. The biggest problem this world has is nuclear proliferation. And we have a country out there in North Korea, which is sort of wacko, which is not a, dumb, not a bunch of dummies, and they are going out and they are developing nuclear weapons. And they're not doing it because they're having fun doing it, they're doing it for a reason. And wouldn't it be good to sit down and really negotiate something, and ideally negotiate? Now, if that negotiation doesn't work, you better solve the problem now than solve it later, Tim. And you know it, and every politician knows it, and nobody wants to talk about it. Jimmy Carter, who I really like, and he went over there, it was so soft. These people are laughing at us. The former general of the Air Force, Merrill McPeak, the former Secretary of Defense, Les Aspen, said you could not launch a preemptive strike against North Korea because the nuclear fallout could be devastating to the Asian Peninsula. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about us using nuclear weapons. I'm saying that they have areas where they're developing missiles. No, but taking out their nuclear potential you know that this country, would create Tim, a fallout. Tim, do you know that this country went out and gave them nuclear reactors 
free fuel for 10 years. We, we virtually tried to bribe them into stopping, and they're continuing to do what they're doing, and they're laughing at us. They think we're a bunch of dummies. I'm saying that we have to do something to stop. But if the military Ideally, told you, Mr. Trump, we can't do this. You're giving me two names. You're giving me two names. I don't know. You want to do it in five years when they have warheads all over the place, every one of them pointing to New York City, to Washington, and every one of our... Is that when you want to do it? Or do you want to do something now? You better do it now. Wow. Is that prophetic or what, folks? So Trump goes to Pennsylvania to stump for this guy, Rick Saccone. And again, it was a classic speech. Unreal. His base just loved him. And one thing he did say, and it's been all over the news now early this week, is that Maxine Waters has a low IQ. Well, let's explore that. He is wrapping his arms around Putin uh, while uh, Putin is continuing uh, to advance uh, into Korea. I do not wish to debate. I wish to ask, is there one United States senator who will join me in this letter? There's of no debate. There is no debate. Gentlewoman will suspend. I have not called for impeachment. You said uh, I'm going to fight I, every day until he's impeached. That's what you tweeted. Yeah, but here's what I've said. My greatest desire is to lead him right into impeachment. Impeach 45. Impeach 45. Impeach 45. Put the question squarely on the table whether or not he should be impeached. My greatest desire is to lead him right into impeachment. I have not called for the impeachment yet. He's doing it himself. Leads to the possibility of impeachment. Impeach, 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 impeachment, impeachment, impeachment. If we can prove collusion that he is impeachable. A lot of people don't want to talk about that, but I do. I don't believe anything that Donald Trump says. I don't trust him. I don't believe him. I have no intentions of sitting down with him. I oppose this president. I do not honor this president. I do not respect this president. If he invited you to the White House to meet on common ground? Oh, no, I won't go. I'm not going to sit down with him. I'm not going to go. I'm not going to pretend. I'm not pretending. And in this ceremony, people laugh, they smile, they shake hands, they hug each other, they honor the president. I'm not about any of that. Well, I hope he's not there for four years. Trump has the Kremlin clan surrounding him. I want to talk about this Kremlin clan. Kremlin clan. And the fact that uh, he is wrapping his arms around Putin would be about basically taking over and the government running all of your companies. It's all catching up with Bill O'Reilly and that sexual harassment enterprise that they created over there at Fox. Are you going to say to Fox News when they try and choke us, lie on us, undermine us, and destroy us, we're going to turn the television off on you. They need to go to jail. Uh, Bill O'Reilly needs to go to jail. This is a bunch of scumbags. That's what they are. Those are very We're strong all words, organized around making money. As far as I'm concerned, the Tea Party can go straight to hell. This billionaire wannabe teacher. And I intend to have him get there. The Republicans were out there having a great time. They were laughing. They were waving the American flag. They were egging them on. And I thought that was outrageous behavior. It's classified and we can't tell you anything. All I can tell you is the FBI director has no credibility. And neither do you, Maxine Waters. You I really midget. would like to know what her IQ is. Of course, everybody's going to say, it's racist. Come on. This woman her is an IQ absolute joke. Her IQ has nothing joke. to do with racism. No, it has everything to do with, she's stupid. Yeah. I'm sorry. She is stupid. Speaking yeah. of stupid, Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> she's clinging to her Cherokee ancestry. <laughs> This baseball season is starting up soon, isn't it? (laughs) How bad are the Atlanta Braves going to be? Well, I don't know, but... So yeah, Elizabeth she doesn't want to Warren, take a DNA test. No, right? she doesn't want to take a DNA test. So let's let's look at the possible field as it starts to shape up here for 2020 for president. So Elizabeth Warren is clinging to her Cherokee ancestry, which she still claims that she has, but she's declined a DNA test. Well, now, folks, she says, well, she's not running for president. So what pops up? Another older rich guy, rich white guy by the, actually, 
by the name of Joe Biden. So let's review Joe Biden gaffes. And Neil Smith, an old butt buddy. Are you here, Neil? Neil Smith, an old butt buddy. Are you here, Neil? Neil, I miss you, man. This election year, the choice is clear. One man stands ready to deliver change we desperately need. A man I'm proud to call my friend. A man who will be the next president of the United States, Barack America. A man I'm proud to call my friend. A man who will be the next president of the United States, Barack America. I mean, you got the first sort of mainstream African American yeah. who is articulate and bright and, and, and clean and nice looking guy. As I told my wife, we live in an area that's wooded and somewhat secluded. I said, Jill, if there's ever a problem, just walk out on the balcony here or walk out, put that double barrel shotgun and fire two blasts outside the house. I promise you, who's ever coming in is not going to. You don't need an AR-15. It's harder to aim. It's harder to use. And in fact, you don't need 30 rounds to protect yourself. Buy a shotgun. Buy a shotgun. In Delaware, the largest growth in population is Indian Americans moving from India. You cannot go to a 7-Eleven or a Dunkin' Donuts unless you have a slight Indian accent. So for, I'm not joking. And I also am told that, uh, that uh, uh, Chuck Graham, state senator, is here. Chuck, stand up. Chuck, let him see you. Oh, God love you. What am I talking about? I tell you what, you're making everybody else stand up, though, pal. Thank you very, very much. I tell you what, stand up for Chuck. Look, John's last-minute economic plan does nothing to tackle the number one job facing the middle class. And it happens to be, as Barack says, a three-letter word, jobs, J-O-B-S. Words have in the past gotten you in trouble, words that were borrowed and words that some found hateful. An editorial in the Los Angeles Times said, in addition to his uncontrolled verbosity, Biden is a gaffe machine. Can you reassure voters in this country that you would have the discipline you would need on the world stage, Senator? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Biden. Just can't make this stuff up. By the way, I know you can't see it because it is radio, but the Chuck he referred to was in a wheelchair. That's when he said, okay, stand up, Chuck. Uh, oops, you can't do that. I mean, this guy is a total gaffe machine. But the problem is the left has to bring down Donald Trump because they know they have nothing, have no message. But, I mean, what about the, the part... With the AR-15, shooting it through a, a door. Well, here's what I would argue with one Joe Biden, who obviously knows very little about weapons, and he knows probably even less about perpetrators. He tells his wife to go out on the back porch and discharge a double-barrel shotgun. First of all, my guess is that it would probably knock her down. Secondly, everybody knows that once you pull the trigger twice with a shotgun, you have to reload it. And if she's not carrying new shells in her pocket, she's done. So Joe Biden, I would argue that in the case of someone that is approaching my home and they have, let's just say, the minimal of a six-round revolver, once Mrs. Biden has shot both of the shotgun shells out of her shotgun... And falls backwards and blows out her shoulder. There's six more. So she would have to reload three times to be on an equal playing field with somebody that has the minimum of a six-round revolver. But just the act of what he's saying to do is insane. Irresponsibly You don't know who's shoot. on the other side of the door. Yeah. What an idiot. Well, he told her to go out on the porch. Oh, okay. Go out on the balcony mm-hmm. and shoot it aimlessly into space. Yeah, that's a good idea, too. Meanwhile, in a knee-jerk reaction, 
Republican Florida Governor Rick Scott essentially raised the age to buy a rifle to 21. You know that's going to go to the That's Supreme going to help Court. everything. Yeah. That'll solve the problem, It, it Rick. would have solved absolutely nothing as far as this. And you know there's a, a, a march of school kids. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's up into Tallahassee. I think they've already been to Tallahassee. Possibly up to Washington, D.C. But I heard a caller into uh, Hannity's show yesterday who actually said she lives in the area. Her son was told, you have to go to this march. They're actually not going to have class. You have to go to this march. So she and a bunch of people are just keeping their kids home. They're being told they have to go to this march. Really? Now. So meanwhile, spring break is getting underway at the Redneck that's where all Riviera. The, uh, that's where all the responsible right. millennials show Panama up. Panama City Beach and assorted other areas. They're Everybody's all under 21. Everybody's going to be proud of their daughter that yeah, week. I'm sure they're all going to mm-hmm. be doing drugs and they're going to be drinking. Mm-hmm. They're all under the age of 21. So I got an idea. Let's raise the voting age back to 21 as well, since you can't drink until you're 21, and you obviously can't get drafted anymore, and you can't have a gun, which was the whole idea of bringing it back to 18, because back during the Vietnam War, I'm old enough to remember that, you could get drafted. You could learn how, in fact, you get drafted at 17, so you're learning how to use a gun right off the bat. Mm -hmm. So they said, if you can do that, and you can go fight and die for your country, you should be able to vote. And I agree. But now, that's not the case. We have generations after generations of snowflakes, so let's raise the voting age back to 21 as well. How about that? Yeah, and while we're at it, why don't we make it to where you must be a property owner in, 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 to be able to vote? Hey, that was the original thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, hey, Arnold Skin Schwarzenegger. in the game. Exactly. Hey, Arnold Schwarzenegger is suing Big Oil for first-degree murder. Meanwhile, he took a private jet to and from Sacramento when he was governor because he essentially lived in L.A. What a joke. I'd like to see the carbon footprint of some of these Hollywood elites. You know that? By the way, the latest poll taken by California's governor's office asked people who live in California if they think illegal immigration is a serious problem. 29% of respondents answered, yes, it is a serious problem. 71% of uh, respondents answered, no es una problema, (laughs) serios. Seriosa. Se llamo (laughs) Donaldo Nguyen. Hey, we have a new segment coming up on our show right after the break. It's called The Fed Up Professor. You want to talk about the state of education. It's a new segment. This professor is talking about the state of higher education or lack thereof. So that's called The Fed Up Professor. Just a minute of your time is all you need to hear how bad public education is in this country. Then we'll be talking to Brendy Richards, our friend from South Africa, the chilling white genocide, really, that's starting in her country. Dr. Elena George uh, will follow Brendy. She's got the latest on health care or lack thereof. And then Michael Cutler to round out the show with the latest on immigration reform or lack thereof. It's all coming up next on Cowboy Logic Radio. Cowboys didn't dance, didn't wear designer shirts. With their hearts were filled with memories, their bodies filled with hurt. They would sit around the campfire and exchange a piercing glance. Back when the West was really wild. When their hearts were filled with memories, their bodies filled with birds, they would sit around the campfire and exchange a piercing glance. Yes, back when the West was really wild, cowboys didn't dance. Check us out on the web at cowboylogic.us. Hi, thank you for listening. My name is Ron Phillips, and I'm the owner and operations manager of Talk America Radio. It is with great pride that I offer you this 24-7 stream of some of the finest talk radio programming in the country, but I need your support. We are a listener-supported network. That means we need your help to continue to offer the quality programming you're hearing right now. If you're able, please visit talkamericaradio.us and click the Support Us button. Your donation will go a long way in helping us continue to share the American voice. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm a conservative PhD in my 18th year teaching in the humanities at a taxpayer-funded state university. Cowboy Logic invited me to be your eyes and ears in classrooms, faculty meetings, and to describe the collision of far-leftist ideology, minimal real-world experience, and tenure. Think Teamsters Union. Call me the fed-up professor, and this is the Chronicles of Lower Education. Future editions will reveal the nonsense arising from the university's core value of diversity. We'll look at faculty biographies and research projects, student organizations, the mission statements, and maybe you can help me figure out why so many new female humanities faculty color their hair blue and gain 30 pounds in their first year. Oh, and yesterday, a third-year student accused me of committing a microaggression. I'll tell you how that worked out for him. But let's end on a positive note for now. Most of my students are great, but they're scared to death. They know what unconscious bias is, to the extent that any of us can figure that out. But very few of them can write a coherent sentence to save their lives. The education system has failed them, and they know it. They really just need us to teach them how to think rationally, not parrot, lazy, topsy-turvy, anti-intellectual leftist ideology. And wouldn't it be wonderful to produce college graduates who love our country and value the gifts of Western civilization? So until next time, remember, the meaning of life lies within a perfectly punctuated sentence. More soon from the Fed Up Professor. This is Don Newen, co-host of the Drive Time Sit Rep. Join me as I call in to my intel analyst, Denise Simon, for my daily situation report, or Sit Rep, the Drive Time Sit Rep. Check TalkAmericaRadio.us for more information and showtimes. Hi, this is Michelle Malkin from CRTV.com, and you're listening to Talk America Radio, the new dominant force in conservative talk radio. You're listening to your local news source, WLBB, News Talk 1330 and FM 106.3. Hey, everybody, they're back on again. Cowboys didn't dance, didn't wear designer shirts. Change a piercing way, yes. Back when the West was really wild, yeah, didn't they? Welcome back to Cowboy Logic Radio. I'm Donna Fiducia, along with Don Newen. And our very special guest for this next half hour is somebody that we've had on years ago when she did a show on our network for a while as well called the truth about south africa her name is brendy richards she is a native of south africa unfortunately she's not able to do the show any longer but you can find information at the truth about south org. brendy richards welcome back to cowboy logic radio i think it's really important we highlight what is going on right now in south africa mainly because the mainstream media isn't Oh, thanks for having me back. It's wonderful to talk to you guys again. Yes, and thanks for the opportunity, John. And uh, I have been, obviously, the last couple of years trying to, to highlight the plight of the South Africans. But um, as you know, and as you say, the, the mainstream media, or as we call it, the, the um, Ministry of Smoke and Mirrors, are not reporting it. And, and uh, the reason I think they're not doing it is because there is a, an agenda behind it. Mm -hmm. And if you look at what has happened in my country over the last 20 years, and I've been saying this since I came on your show in 2014, the same things are happening in America. And having been in America for the last two years, I can see it. I mean, they're taking down your statues, in other words, trying to erase your identity, villainizing you, blaming white people for everything from slavery to privilege to goodness knows what else. And, And those words... Um, racism and privilege, it's all just words in the arsenal of, you know, weaponized words, if you 
think about it. I mean, nowhere in the Bible does it say thou shalt not be a racist. The word racist just really means that you look after your own and you take care of your own culture. It doesn't mean you hate other people, but they've weaponized it and they've made it sound like this evil thing, just like they, they did with the word apartheid, which only means segregation and you know in 1948 there was segregation all over the world so i'm not justifying it i'm just saying it was the way it was at the time and uh but they took the word they made it a hate word and they weaponized the word and and it's all just designed to to create division and what has happened now 20 years later um it was a process first they took our guns then they took our um our identity. In other words, they changed our flag, they changed our anthem, and then they changed the, the language in, in all the universities and the schools. So the next thing we knew, there was no identity for, for an entire group of people. And uh, now they are ex- going to expropriate the land without compensation. In other words, changing the constitution. They, they have to change the constitution to do that. And this is what they're doing now because they have the majority. But they had to flood the country with people from across the border to have that uh, majority. And it took 20 years. So this was really thought out well and planned and, and executed. And, and now you have this Malema guy who is the, the head of the freedom uh, or the economic freedom fighters who's saying that they have to cut the throat of whiteness. Now, if you understand the culture of, of those people in South Africa, um, still obviously being involved in, in witchcraft and, and tradition and, you know, ancestor worship, cut the throat of whiteness means kill all the whites. So I'm just saying, you know, if there's, if this was the other way around, if 60 million white people turned around and said, we're going to annihilate 4 million black people, it would be an absolute outcry. I mean, there would be intervention. But somehow, for some reason, this is not a problem to the mainstream media. And the reason I think really is because it's a, there's an agenda behind it, because you can see the same pattern play out in Venezuela and in America and everywhere where communism is trying to take over. They ultimately want to destroy people that can think, stand for themselves and defend themselves. So there it is. They they disarm you. They take you, strip you from your identity. They erase your history, and ultimately, then they kill you. Ladies and gentlemen, we're speaking with our dear friend Brendy Richards, a native of South Africa who we have had on our show numerous times, uh, discussing the absolute horrifying plight that's taking place in South Africa. Brendy, one of the uh, most recent times that you were on with us, I ask you a series of questions regarding gun control. Now, when, and I want to ask this again for our listeners, how many years took place between the time in which you were able to lawfully own a weapon in order to defend yourself to the point in which you no longer were lawfully allowed to possess a weapon to protect yourself? There was a number of years that took place while that worked its way through the new system. How many years was that? Don, it was for me to finally lose my gun license. Um, it took about between 12 and 15 years. So it was a process. The first thing they did is they went after the automatic weapons. Same thing that they're doing here now. They're villainizing the AR-15, which is a 22 caliber. I don't know why they're doing that, but this is exactly the same method. And uh, the first thing they did is they took those weapons. Then they started going after the mental, uh, they can take your guns if you have any mental condition. The problem with that is, look, I don't want an insane person wielding a gun. Nobody does. But the problem with that law is that they establish what is insane and what isn't. Um, If you think why I lost my gun license, um, this is about five years ago, and, and why it wasn't renewed is because they found out that when my son was born 22 years ago, that I had a bit of baby blues, and I was on antidepressants for a couple of months, and, and it was over. I mean, it was a non-event. 
But they found that in my medical records and they declined my gun license because I was on antidepressants for two months, 22 years ago. Essentially postpartum depression. Yes, it was a bit of baby blues. That was, you know, when it wasn't an, a, a, a bad case of it, but I had a bit of a baby blues, which, you know, a lot of women get. It's a normal it's part of life. But it wasn't like I was debilitated or, you know, unable to function in society. I was a bit down. I got over it, you know. It was an adjustment to get a new baby in your life, especially if you're a single mom. So it was just a moment in time that was a non-event and 22 years later, I get declined on my gun license because, you know, because they found this in my medical record, something I've completely forgotten about. You know, it's been 20 years. I who remembers that. So that is what they are doing. And when I saw the article in, in the news, on, I think it was on Friday, that they are actually starting confiscating weapons in Seattle, Washington, on the law of insanity or, you know, um, uh, the fact that people are not able, or the government establishes whether you are sane or not, that's worrying because that means they're ramping up this process. And the reason they are is to disarm you. And the moment you are disarmed, they step into the next thing. And I mean, I, I watched them remove the Robert E. Lee statue, yeah, because of slavery. But I mean, if I go and read your, your history, uh, it, it, it it wasn't like that. So they they change history. They they rewrite the history books. They take the identity. They brainwash your kids with the biggest load of nonsense and social justice bar, garbage. And um, uh, so the, the the next generation is brainwashed. I mean, you can just listen to them speak and, and they, how they get triggered and how they need Play-Doh and puppies to just survive. I mean, it's just... It's like they've been programmed, and but the same happened, and this is why I started my blog in South Africa in 2014, and how you got to meet me is I was helping my son doing his history homework, and I read, the, I read his history textbook, and it was like, hang on, this is not what happened. They rewrite history, and what they did in my country, too, is they erased the records. The buildings that kept the records of births and, and, and the entire history of people they burned it and they took down the statues and now they're villainizing people based on the fact that they are white because we stole land. Nobody stole land. If you go read the real history, it didn't happen like that. But it was all propaganda. All right, Brandy, one of the comments that you just made with regard to they, you know, if you read history, uh, unfortunately, based on what I can tell and what you've discussed in the past, the current president of South Africa can't read, period. Is that, uh, and if he can, he can read at what, a second, third, fourth grade level? Well, you know, the, the previous president, President Zuma, he couldn't read. I mean, he could kind of read, but it was interesting to listen to that. And um, he couldn't count at all. I mean, you can just Google it, Zuma counting. It's, it's, it's a joke, just do it. But, and, and he also thought that the entire continent of the world, if you put them together, fit into the continent of Africa. So he had no concept of the world. But then again, if you think about it, the, the entire, um, there's a new president now, Cyril Ramaphosa, which is very, very dangerous. He is a hardcore communist, hardcore, and he just announced in parliament that they are going to expropriate land without compensation, meaning he's going to change the, con the, the constitution, meaning they have finally got the numbers to change the constitution. And this is the same rhetoric that's in, in America, that the constitution is somehow a living document, you know, and that the founding fathers didn't know what they were doing. It's the same stuff. And we can't, you can't allow it to happen because the ultimate object, objective is to kill you, to destroy this country, to flood it with people that will vote and keep people in power that is behind the scenes. Because if you look at that face that just announced that Bravo Sierra in a parliament, he, he's a puppet. And that's the reason why he's there, because those people can be bribed and, you know, and, and they stay in power. It's beca it becomes a dictatorship. But the people behind it, the likes of Soros, and if you, if you 
if you pe- people think I'm going on on this conspiracy theory if I say this, but it's not. It's the truth. Go Google our last white president, the clerk who sold our country out to the communists, and you will see all his pictures. The clerk and Soros, they were best of friends. So these guys are behind it. So they making it sound like oh the plight of black people and poor black people and that they need to take back the land. You know that the government owns over sixty percent of good farmland. That was given back to them over 20 years ago with a change of government. They, they, they just need to develop it, but they don't. Only 2% of the minority of white people left actually still own land. And they now want to take that. And those people are feeding the entire continent of Africa. So I don't know, they're going to starve. But my, my point is, and this is why I am absolutely in a state and, and why I'm, I really appreciate you giving me this platform, is people don't understand what it's like to lose everything. Lose your identity, lose your country. I mean, I'm not there. I'm here. And, and I, as much as I love America and being here, I miss home. I miss my home. I miss my people. I miss my culture. I miss my language. And not only do I miss it, My family is stuck there, and I'm so worried. And over and above the fact that I'm worried about things. Do you know how guilty I feel? Yeah. Everybody say, you must must be so grateful, and you're so lucky you are safe. Yeah, I I am. But do I deserve it? And shouldn't I go back and die with him? You know, how it messes with your mind is almost insane. People don't understand what happens when you lose everything. And you have no chance to defend yourself now. Your family's back there. You have no way of of protecting them. And you've got a president of a country that's basically saying, kill the whites and we're not going to uh, prosecute anybody who does. I mean, and that's Zimbabwe, same thing, correct? Well, Zimbabwe had already happened. There's there's, there's hardly any um, whites left there. And um, there's also now a new president. But, I mean, they killed everyone, pretty much all the farmers. And the, the race of the farmers fled to Zambia. My sister was married to a, a Zimbabwean farmer, and, and she watched her, her father-in-law murdered in front of her. <laughs> so it was dramatic. They left that country. They crossed Bait Bridge, which is the borderline. They weren't even allowed to take their vehicle out of the car, um, out, of the, out of the country. They literally left with a three-month-old baby in a suitcase. And they, they went to Zambia, and she finally came back to South Africa because, I mean, it was just so traumatic. But the point is that this is happening, and, and it's, it's, they are finally going to get rid of every white person in, in South Africa. And, and my plight on your show today is my people, there's about 4 million people left. 800,000 of them are in squatter camps because there's over 100 laws preventing them to even get employed. You know, the, the government actually published an article saying that they should even, a government job should rather be vacant than employ a white person. Um, Malema just went out and said they're going to take the mayor of, of um, Port Elizabeth or now Nelson Mandela Bay because that's another story what the communists do. They start changing names of everything. But the point is that, um, that they're going to force remove this mayor because he's white. I imagine that the other way around. That will be a, a, an atrocity, but this way some, they have to cut the throat of whiteness. That means that everyone now has been given the authority of government to go and kill white people. Well, Brendy Richards, you have always said that it's not a matter of black and white, or uh, black and white, it's a matter of wrong and right. Uh, yeah, and good and evil. It, it, they're using this whole racism thing, and that's why I said it. it's a, they, they weaponize the word. I have no problem with people wanting to preserve who they are, you know, and their language and their culture, and that is really what apartheid was. The word apartheid, again, just by my, me saying it, people are almost, you know, feeling like they've been shot when they hear the word because it's been weaponized. It means that what we did is this, they it's over nine tribes in South Africa, Kosa, Venda, Zutu, Zulus, northern Zutus, and then these tribes were warring tribes. They were killing each other. The solution was to build a country for every tribe to 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 grow and prosper, to educate their children with their own culture, their own language, their own, and they loved it. And if you go and and Google um, uh, H. F. Verwurt, who they call the father of apartheid. 
he was our president. He was assassinated, mind you. People don't even know that history exactly the same as they did with Kennedy by the same people because he was... He, he, he was doing the same things. He was wanting a gold-backed currency. He was doing the same thing. And they loved him. Go listen to his speeches and, and also him talking to these black leaders of all these homelands and how they appreciated it. I mean, they got good land. I heard in America, apparently, we gave them swamp land. That's, that's the biggest load of nonsense. All that land was given back to South Africa. And if you look at it, Namibia and I think Swaziland, they were our homelands too. They said, oh, no, we don't want to be part of South Africa. We love being our homeland. So they remained homelands and, and, and separate countries. So if it was that terrible, why, why did they do that? So it's just the fact that they distorted history. They didn't tell the truth. They didn't have the Internet back then. And uh, in other words, they could tell everybody in America whatever they wanted, how evil these white people were. Were, we got absolutely villainized as these racist bunch of people. I mean, we're a bunch of Dutch people. Go and look in, in, in the Netherlands how liberal they are. I mean, that's the point. Yeah. We, we prov- Everything was provided for them. Today, those same people that everybody was marching down the street for is dying of hunger in squalor. I mean, those same black people. Are, are absolutely, they don't have health care anymore because the entire system fell apart. The roads are falling apart. The education system is non-existing. I mean, everything in that country has gone communist. Nobody's looking after the country. It's just the big dictators at the top. It's Venezuela. The- it's basically what ve- happened in Venezuela. You even said if you go to the hospital in, in South Africa, you got to bring your own mattress. And that's yeah, probably good. You know, that's probably a better condition. I mean, it's crazy. But the thing is, you have a situation there with a minority of whites. Here in the United States, you have a minority of blacks still, whether people want to believe it or not. We're still mostly a white nation. So now what they have to do, because they can't just uh, say we're evil, they have to have white privilege. So you got to feel shamed if you're white. And then, of course, like you said, in your country, they took away the Second Amendment for the most part. That's what they've been doing here. They're changing the statues. It's unbelievable how this is totally what happened in South Africa, and there is nothing being reported in the media on this. The whole thing is done, and this is what I keep saying. If you mix the same ingredients, you're baking the same cake. And what I can tell you, just having grown up there, having lived there my 20 years of my adult life and now coming here, I'm looking at this and I'm going, I feel like I'm in the twilight zone. It really is because all the same things are happening. And a lot of the words and the rhetoric that I heard 20 years ago is now all of, all of a sudden talking points in this country. The, the best thing that could have happened to this country is the fact that Hillary did not win because if she did, and it would have been just one downhill slope from mm-hmm. the at least now we have somebody in the White House that I can see is trying to fight this because this is a bigger agenda. This is a bigger picture. I don't know. All I know is that sorrows of we're friends with, with the clerk, but then and the Rothschilds and the banking people. And I mean, there's a lot of story. I don't know. We don't know what we don't know. But I can tell you what, I can spot a trend and this is a trend. Ladies and gentlemen, we're speaking with our dear friend, Brendy Richards. Her website, thetruthaboutsouthafrica.org. We encourage you to go visit that website. Brendy, I want to get your take on a um, an older video clip that's been circulating recently that involves Oprah Winfrey. Are you familiar with the one I'm talking about? Is that the one where she says that uh, these people must just die? Yes. Old white yeah. people got to die. I want to get your take and your interpretation of the Oprah Winfrey video, given the fact that you're a native of South Africa? Well, my take on that is just before that, she's she's going on, if you lo- listen to her entire thing, she's going on about spending, I don't know how many days in Nelson Mandela's house and how she came and built a school in South Africa, which, you know, is her pride and joy. It's a joke. I mean, if you know what really happened in that school, those girls were raped and and there was so much scandal. They stole money. It it was just just the same thing that happens in a communist country. That happened. But that's not the point. The point is that she says that there are people with a mindset that... um, 
uh, they, they are racist and uh, all these things and they must just die. And this is exactly what is happening in South Africa. They feel that the people that they have now finally got the minority, they are finally disarmed, they finally have no fight back left in them. Um, so they've been stripped of that, uh, their identity. They've been stripped of all of what they think they can fight back with. And this is the same what, what Hitler said, naked people don't fight back. And that's what they did. They stripped us. And now they're going to kill us. And the reason is because Oprah Winfrey and whoever told her to say that behind the scenes, because these people are in the media and in celebrity are all mouthpieces for whoever pulls their strings and whoever funds them and keeps them relevant. Um, but that's what they want to do. They want to, they don't just feel that we should just die. They actually want to kill you. And if, if we give them the power to take our guns, to take our freedom, to change the constitution, to, to wipe our history. And if we do that and if we allow that, they will kill you. That is the end. Look at South Africa. I said it's a blueprint and that is what's happening now. You know, and, and so only- many people here don't believe the Second Amendment was actually made to help freed slaves protect themselves. And this is how, if you don't have history, you're bound to repeat it if you don't know it. And I know, Brendy, remember, I'm old enough to remember when Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band were singing, no, I'm not going to play Sin City anymore because of apartheid. And there was a big move from the uh, the media and from the from Hollywood leftists about how terrible apartheid was. And your father was a big Springsteen fan. You took him to see Springsteen in South Africa. And he started talking about how what how great Nelson Mandela was and everything else. And here you are, some of the few whites that are left in South Africa watching this concert going like, because <gasps> Springsteen's clueless, you know, and he 20 is, years later, they're still blaming apartheid. And, and that's exactly the fact that his concert was in Soweto, which is a, a, a predominantly black area. And over 70,000 white people packed a stadium in Soweto. Well, that's unheard of. No, nobody goes to Soweto. It's like going to Detroit, you know, if you have a death wish, you know. But they all thought, go went there to go see Springsteen. There's this moron on stage, and I'm sorry to call him that, hopping up and down like an insane person singing about freeing Mandela and to the audience, the the people that that have just been sold out. The woman next to me burst out in tears. She was sitting in a wheelchair. Her husband was just murdered the week before. She was still recovering from the attack. She came to the concert because her husband loved Bruce Springsteen. She burst out in tears. I had to push her out. I mean, the only people that was hopping up and down and singing with him were the, were the hot dog sellers, you know. Uh, and uh, it's it, it's just a joke. It's a joke. It is. Well, Brendy Richards, unfortunately, our time is up. Find all this information, folks, at uh, her website, thetruthaboutsouthafrica.org. Thetruthaboutsouthafrica.org. Folks, it's a blueprint for what's going on here, almost to the T in the United States. And, Brendy, we, we uh, send you our love, and, and hopefully your family will be safe. But um, keep us posted as to what's going on, and we love you. Take care, okay? Thank you, Donna. Take care. God bless. All right, and coming up after the break, we're going to be talking about health care with Dr. Elena George and to close out the show, Immigration with Michael Cutler. It's all coming up next on Cowboy Logic Radio. Cowboys didn't dance, didn't wear designer shirts. Hello everyone, I'm Donna Fiducia. And I'm Don Newen. And this 
is Cowboy Logic Radio. Cowboys didn't dance, didn't wear designer shirts, but their hearts were filled with memories, their bodies filled with birds. They would sit around the campfire and exchange a piercing glare. Yes, back when the West was really wild, Cowboys didn't dance. Welcome back to Cowboy Logic Radio. I'm Donna Fiducia, along with Don Newen. Who's going to behave? You are going to behave because we have somebody who we know very well, but it's been a while since we've had her on the show, so you, you really need to watch your P's and Q's, okay? She is a well-known doctor, and I must say, from my neck of the woods up in New Jersey. She's also an author. We're talking about Dr. Elena George, author of the book Big Medicine, The Cost of Corporate Control and How Doctors and Patients Working Together Can Rebuild a Better System. That came out uh, just in the last year or so. She's a board-certified ear, nose, and throat specialist, Princeton University educated. And then, of course, she went to... Uh, what, so you got a master's in microbiology from Long Island U. Then you went to Mount Sinai right. in New York City. Then Manhattan Ear, Nose, and Throat. <laughs> What kind of a brainiac are you? I'd like to see what your MCAT score was. <laughs> Advisory Council of Project 21, which is the Black Leadership Network, an initiative of the National Center for Public Policy Research, and host of a show called Medicine on Call. You can find it on iTunes and Spotify. Just search for Medicine on Call. She's got years and years of archived shows. And Dr. Elena George, we also met you pretty much with Liberty Health Share because this is an alternative okay. to uh, big corporate medicine and huge uh you know amounts of money that people are spending every month for health care that they're not getting any really decent uh, medical coverage about and so dr elena george welcome back to cowboy logic radio thank you it's a pleasure to be back with you guys so tell us right off the bat hold on a second i need to interject something here uh -huh. dr george at what point in your career yeah. are you going to start practicing all areas of medicine because uh, we need one go-to doctor for everything, all surgeries, everything, and, and you would be the go-to gal for this. I'm sorry about that. I mean, I do practice. Uh, ear, nose, and throat has a lot of medical as well as surgical applications, but I love what I do, but I can always get you to somebody who I trust, so don't worry <laughs> about it. I got you. Yeah, but if I break an arm, I'm still coming to you, and you can look in my ear, and then you can go, all right, let's deal all with right, the arm. arm's broken. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But, <laughs> no, we just love you to death. That's 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 the point, ladies and gentlemen. This is if 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 the United States was made up of doctors like Doctor Elena George, we'd be in good shape. Yeah, and period. End of story. I think I saw you on Newsmax originally, and I'm like, oh my god, she's right here in mm -hmm. Atlanta too, which is very cool. And the thing is, what you have found with Liberty Health Share and basically how you practice your medicine that um, it doesn't have to be that expensive. But um, tell no. us, first of all, as a, as a doctor, what happens as, as far as trying to see patients and then getting paid for your services, which is like pulling teeth with these big, um, you know, basically insurance all the big companies. companies, insurance companies. Well, it's gotten harder since the Affordable Care Act passed. There were dozens of insurance companies. Now there are about four major, you know, nationwide insurance companies, and they, they don't have to follow antitrust law, law like everybody else, doctors you know, we'd get dinged if we even talk to a colleague and tell them what we're charging a patient. We'd be run out on a rail and they can do whatever they like and they become all powerful. They are now in a position over the past eight years of controlling a majority of the healthcare dollar, but they don't provide a service. They don't treat people. They don't take care of people. They just move the money around. And seven cents of the healthcare dollar is going to the doctor. The rest is administrative fees. If you look at the hospital, for example, there's 16 administrators per doctor. That's the ratio. So medicine has become a big business. It's become corporatized. You have Wall Street now coming in with uh, various, you know, startups that are all about uh, using computers and uh, artificial intelligence to try to run you know, uh, an office visit. And we've gotten to the point that doctors and patients are, who should be the focal point are on the outside looking in. And the health care isn't any better. That's the other problem. So if you know that the, the, the life expectancy over the past eight years has dropped two years in a row, I think everybody should start asking themselves, are we moving in the right direction? Yeah, I don't think that's a coincidence. 
I really think that's by design. No. I hate to say it. And what gets me so annoyed is they sit there and they call Medicare an entitlement. It's not an entitlement. We worked for that. We are in, we, yeah. we are entitled to it, but it was stripped of, what, $600 billion or something given to Medicaid under Obamacare? And I know that Obamacare has not been totally repealed, but are you seeing any kind of improvement at all as far as dealing with it? Well, I actually, I don't deal with it. Uh, so I don't take the Affordable Care Act plans in my office. I used to, but because they stopped paying, you know, you do the service, you go through the whole um, routine of getting pre-certification, speaking to the insurance company, getting the approval, and then after you did the service, they would deny it, saying that it was un- not medically necessary, not covered. And it just got really old very quickly because that's a recipe to go out of business, providing a service and not getting paid. And the, you ask about what it's like for a doctor. That's what it's like. You have to go through all these hoops with insurance companies. The, the patient doesn't know what their benefits are nine times out of ten. So you have to call the insurance company and be on the phone for hours on end. You get the pre-certification, and there's always some sort of glitch, especially if it's a high-ticket item, where they refuse to pay you for some technicality. And every time you, you, you interact with them, it's another 30 days. and another. I mean, it's just unconscionable what they're doing. And that's one of the reasons that doctors have been pushed out of private practice, and they've gone into the hospital system, because they don't want to deal with this. They'd rather just get a paycheck and let the hospital take care of, of everything. But that really is not the answer. And we're seeing now what... That, you know, what that wrought to the, you know, is bringing to the healthcare system. People can't get in to see doctors. It's much more expensive because the hospital charge master is what they're using instead of their independent practice charges. It's much more expensive for the reasons I just described. 16 to 1 administrator to doctor ratio, CEOs making out like bandits, hospitals building out palaces and buying up other hospitals. This is not one, you know, when you think about business, you think about the thing is the more the more um, cost savings you get in the hospital system, in the healthcare system, the bigger it gets, the more expensive it gets because it's a monopoly and it's the only game in town. And that needs to be addressed as well. Dr. Elena George uh, is our guest, ladies and gentlemen, a, a fabulous doctor, a doctor that gets it, a doctor that puts the Hippocratic Oath above everything else and the care of her patient above everything else. And we've had the pleasure of knowing the doctor for probably f- almost five years, four or five years, I think. And uh, again, ladies and gentlemen, if, if America was made up of doctors, and there's a lot of great doctors, don't get me wrong, but if, there, if the America was made up of doctors like Dr. Elena George, we probably wouldn't have any, or at least very few of the problems that we have nowadays. Now, doctor, one of the things that I wanted to add to this is the situation that you're talking about where doctors are leaving their private practices and just saying, mm-hmm. screw it, it's a lot easier for me to just be paid uh, by a hospital, by a big conglomerate. That's not only taking place in big cities like Atlanta and, and other large cities across the country, but it's also hit rural America and smaller towns. I'm, we're seeing that same thing take place out where we live in Carroll County. And uh, yeah. it is it is definitely a very serious problem. Now, it may, can we switch just for a moment to talk about Liberty Health Share for a second? Are you guys both okay? Sure. With, yeah. Okay. All right. Mm-hmm. Now, Donna and I are not paid spokesmen for Liberty Health Share, but we do. We are members, and I don't even know what we pay. Donna, you pay the bills, so it's, it's one ninety nine per person. If you're married, it's two ninety nine a month. For family, all right, and that's a family of four, so it's so much cheaper. It's what it was before Obamacare kicked in, basically. All right, Doctor George, let me set up kind mm-hmm. of a hypothetical scenario here, because you are an ENT, mm-hmm. and let's say that I have got, um, I don't know, a really bad sinus infection, and it's it's it's. I've been dealing with this now for about a week and a half, and I need to come see a doctor. So I set up an appointment with you, and I come see you. I present my uh, Liberty Health Share membership card to you. Tell me how mm-hmm. I, as a member, am going to reap great benefits from being a member of Liberty Health Share, and how you, as a doctor, also will receive the benefits, and how the whole process would go from that initial office visit into your diagnosis and your and your uh, treatment of me? Well, actually, it's not much different than having an insurance plan. You present the card to the front desk. 
the front desk, calls Liberty Health Share to find out if you're an active member and to get your quote, benefits and you're seen. And if there's something that needs to be done, like a uh, surgery or a radiology um, uh, appointment, labs, I write the order and I send you and Liberty Health Share pays for it. The only thing that you have to, as a member, worry about or what you're responsible for is your shared amount. Every member has a shared amount of $500 per year that they have to meet before Liberty Health Share starts kicking in and paying for your health care needs. So if you, there's three different plans. One pays for 70%. You're responsible for 30%. The most um, comprehensive pays for 100% after you've um, finished paying your $500 deductible. That's the one I chose. And that's the, that's like the one you guys chose as well. I believe so. So once you've, you've met that, they negotiate directly with the doctor and the hospital, the lab, wherever you're going, you don't have to do anything except give them your Liberty Health Share card. Liberty Health Share takes over from there. And especially with hospitals where they try to kill you with prices, they actually renegotiate your prices and they save money for Liberty Health Share. So they're not paying the same thing that someone pays if they have a Blue Cross or Aetna plan. They're paying the cash pay rate, which is a fraction of what it costs with an insurance plan. That's the key here. Nobody really knows this. And I'll say it a million times. It's cheaper to access our health care system if you pay cash than it is to use an insurance card. And Liberty Health Share is, is basically a consortium of self-pay patients across the country who pool their resources and use the cash pay model. So that's why it's much cheaper. People ask, how come it's so cheap? Because we're not paying 10 times what we're supposed to pay just to have a service done. That's the difference. Well, and, and doctors and hospitals, do, <coughs> excuse me, doctors and hospitals get paid quicker too, don't they? Yeah, when you're paying cash, well, you don't have to put up with all the crap get, of the paperwork too. You don't, but it also is tied to Medicare. And it's 160% of Medicare. The average commercial insurance is 80% of Medicare. And Medicaid is probably 10 cents on the dollar. So you're actually getting, uh, you know, 150%, 160%, or 170%, depending on what you're getting done, of the Medicare rate. So everybody's actually making more money. But you don't have an insurance plan that's taking administrative fees and taking their piece out because it's nonprofit. So basically, it's really the doctor, the patient, the, the medical service, without a middleman. That's the key. And All right. uh, to me, hold that's on. empowering. Okay, and I agree. Now, you use the term once the member fulfills his shared portion, and then you Correct. use the term fi or the, the amount of $500. Ladies and gentlemen, right. that is a synonym for the word deductible, deductible. Exactly. that you are used to hearing. Okay? But, uh, it, with, but it's not, because it's not an insurance plan, so you have to be really... Very yep. clear about that. Yep. It takes, it's similar, but it's not a deductible. So that needs to be clarified. That's what makes a shared, uh, a minister, you know, cost sharing different because it's not insurance. It is basically an indemnity plan. If you want to think about it that way, that you buy, you share a pot with other people and you guys take care of each other's needs. Yep. That's how I would think about it. Now about. But everybody's word means something here. You know, everybody is in it together. There's no people gouging anything and just gaming a system. You know, I, my word means something, and it's about honor. And that's the difference between, I think, people who take and buy insurance in this, this model. I'm not trying to go to the doctor every 20 minutes, but if something happens, I know that I'm going to be able to be covered. That's yep. how it works. Yep. Yeah, I mean, when I go for my regular checkup, quite frankly, I pay for it, and I don't even report it. Because I figure I'm only paying 199 a month. That's, you know, that's pretty darn cheap. I can pay for my yearly check. Well, and, and your friend Tina, what was she well, faced with, yeah, with, my, with her insurance? Well, my friend who's a retired now OBGYN who has now moved down here from New Jersey. I think we've spoken about her before, Dr. Elena George. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Obamacare basically put her out of business. She has over $100,000 worth of um, uh, outstanding bills that haven't been paid. She does have some, some pre-existing conditions. She's trying to get... Um, regular health care, and we're talking even now, fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars a month. I mean, it's it's ridiculous, wow, that's crazy. you know. And and her well, yeah. another doctor problems, that we know has yeah. has got the same kind of stuff. But her know? problems arise from uh, broken arms and and things of that nature that actually occurred falling in a hospital on a wet floor. So she can't operate. Oh, yeah. She's got nerve damage. And and you know, I mean, this is the, it, the whole thing is is crazy because you can't. I don't know. It, it you know to to sit there under Obamacare. Now I guess 
for some people with pre-existing conditions, I'm not sure how things are going to work now with what Trump is trying to do. But of course, once the the premium skyrocketed, they're never going to come back down. And like you say, the life oh. expectancy has has been lowered now in this country for the first time in in a hundred well, years. Donna, I have to say that people need to have a, a, a mind change in this. Everybody's in the mindset of the government needs to take care of me, and the government you know knows all. That's not the mindset you need to have. At this point, you have to handle your own business. Take control of your own pocketbook. And when you do that, there's a, just so many choices out there that you don't have to even worry about, I can't afford it, because it's not true anymore. There is a parallel system. Liberty Health Share knows how to access that. But if you don't want to use Liberty Health Share and you want to use commercial insurance, I would definitely get a high deductible plan, especially if I was healthy. And then I would use direct primary care practices. Those are primary care doctors, specialists all over the country who have a cash pay rate. They list their prices online. You can prepay. The direct primary care is really cool, for example. For a monthly fee, for anywhere from $60 for an individual to 120, 134 family of four, everything that goes on in the doctor's office is covered. Blood work, EKGs, chest x-rays, labs, even prescriptions because they've become their own little island, their own dispensary. That's really cheap. And you get to see the doctor, not some extender or allied health professional. You'll spend an hour, hour, 15 minutes. This is old school medicine where if you cut the middleman out, the price drops dramatically and the quality goes up. I say people should do that. They should do Liberty Health Share. And another little pearl is supplemental policies like AFLAC. Nobody ever talks about it. I didn't even know what it was until the AFLAC representative came to my office. And I ended up purchasing a policy for myself and my office staff on top of Liberty Health Share, where we get paid to stay healthy. So we bought a policy of like fifty dollars a month. It covers accident, covers cancer diagnosis, covers stroke, covers hospitalization, and we're going to get a check for two hundred fifty thousand dollars. God forbid something crazy gets diagnosed, no questions asked. That's how you do this. Mm-hmm. You make sure that you have enough money to control your own destiny. Yeah. Not depending on the government to decide who lives and dies. That's not how you do it. And if you do that, I'm spending about a $250 a month now with Liberty Health Share and my AFLAC policy. And if I go for a colonoscopy or something, I get money back. If I go back up, they pay me. The next day, this is how you do it, guys. Forget yeah. insurance. Maybe you have to carry something catastrophic if you don't want to do Liberty Health Share. But I'm covered now for catastrophic, routine. I can even go out of the country and get you know, medical tourism through Liberty Health Share. I've got it made, and I'm not, I'm not concerned about what the insurance companies do because they don't matter to me. Exactly. Now, there's one other thing, Dr. Elena George, that I want to bring up regarding Liberty Health Share. We had a friend of ours that was looking into this, and she uh, stereotyped Liberty Health Share erroneously and said, well, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, a, I'm Jewish, And they won't take me because it's only Christians. And I went, no, 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 no. That's not true. (laughs) That is not true. You can be a Buddhist. You can be an atheist. You can be whatever you want to be with Liberty Health Share. Now, there are some that are religion specific. Liberty Health Share is not it. What is what's the website, ladies? I don't have any of this in front of me. I guess it's I think it's Liberty Health Share dot org. Actually, it's Liberty on call dot org. Oh, OK. www dot Liberty on call dot org. And the telephone number is 800-714-6993. And I would just want to, you know, reiterate what you said. You don't have to be Christian to join Liberty Health Share. It's about being, it's, you know, libertarian mindset. But you do have to follow Christian guidelines. So, you know, help your neighbor. Um, be honest when you do your questionnaires. It doesn't pay for things like abortion. That's not a Christian value. Well, that and makes that's sense. fine. Mm-hmm. You know, you can, if you want to... I, you know, pay for that stuff, it's on you. But ultimately, there are certain guidelines that you do have to meet. But there's no litmus test. If you're gay, straight, doesn't matter. So that's what's really neat about it. We're talking to Dr. Elena George. Now, her first name is spelled E-L-A-I-N-A. E-L-A-I-N-A. Find her at D R. 
E L A I N A, Dr. Elena George dot com. And also her book, Big Medicine The Cost of Corporate Control and How Doctors and Patients Working Together Can Rebuild a Better System, is out. She's board certified, ear, nose, and throat, New York, New Jersey educated, Princeton University. She's a, she's a brainiac, folks. And uh, she's the host of a show called Medicine on Call. You can find it on iTunes and Spotify. Just look for Medicine on Call. You've got five years of shows there and a lot of wealth of knowledge. And again, um, you are a spokesperson for Liberty Health Share, which, again, full disclosure, Don and I also um, mm-hmm. are members of because it's just a great way to have an alternative for the high cost of health care. Tell us about your book, though, Big Medicine, The Cost of Corporate Control, and How Doctors and Patients Working Together Can Rebuild a Better System. Well, I wanted to write the book so people could understand how we got to this point. Healthcare system really has changed over the last 15 years, then the last five, it really is on steroids going towards a centralized corporate driven system. So my thing is, I'm about freedom, freedom of choice. If you like Obamacare, you should be able to keep it, you know, that's on you. But if you don't, and you want to know the alternatives, the book not only discusses how we got here, but, you know, things that you can use, strategies that you can use to work with, you know, have the healthcare system work in the way you want it to. If you want to do medical tourism, there's links for that. Um, joining, you know, patient-centered doctor groups like Amer- Association of American Physicians and Surgeons, um, Association of Independent Doctors. These are all organizations that would welcome patients to join them and actually start working together because they've done a nice job of divide and conquer, and they've made the doctors the enemy, but we're not. And we really do need to band together to fix this. We're the answer, not the corporate interests or the government. You know, it really scares me. We only have about a minute left, so if you could comment on this. My uh, OB um, was basically bought out by the uh, big health system here in Carrollton, Georgia, for that same reason we talked about earlier, so she doesn't have to worry about all this garbage. But she's gotten like Mm -hmm. a three- or five-year contract. It's almost like what happened when, you know, like people that are in uh, radio and television like I had. When that's up, what's to stop them? Because they basically took over her practice, which took her 20 years to build. When that stops, what's to stop them from getting a, a Pakistani doctor in there for a tenth of the price? And then the health care, you know, little by little, it's, it's deteriorating. You have to follow the money, Donna. I just got back from a conference. And on the horizon, the government is about to decrease the reimbursement to hospitals. They already did it to us, the private physicians. Now the hospitals are going to feel the pain. And they've decided that they're going to use artificial intelligence. They're going to do telemedicine. They're going to use extenders and, you know, foreign-born doctors because they're cheaper. H-1B visa guys, you know, this is what they're doing so they can keep their bottom line, to make as much money on people as possible. And the last piece of the puzzle is to not admit you if you don't have to and put you in hospice. So get the money up front. Get the patient out as fast as possible. Use the cheapest health care providers you can use and make more money. That's not a recipe for health, and that's where we're going. Well, that's really scary because anything the government gets involved with just turns to garbage, in my opinion. Dr. E-L-A-I-N-A, Dr. Elena George dot com is where you can find her stuff. And uh, she's a board certified ear, nose and throat specialist. What's the name of your uh, group in Atlanta, Georgia? Peachtree Ear, Nose and Throat Center. Peachtree Ear, Nose, and Throat Center. So that's easy enough to remember, folks. And look for her uh, show, Medicine on Call. You can find it on iTunes and Spotify. Just search for Medicine on Call. Dr. Elena George, thank you so much for joining us. It's been too long, and uh, unfortunately, I wish you had some better news. But at least with Liberty Health Share, we do have an alternative. Thank you so much, Dr. Elena George, for joining us here on Cowboy Logic Radio. My pleasure. And we'll be Thanks back. Thanks for having me. Thanks, guys. It's always a pleasure. We'll be back with Michael Cutler talking immigration coming up next on Cowboy Logic Radio. Cowboys didn't dance, didn't wear designer shirts. And their hearts were filled with memories, the bodies filled with hurt. They would sit around the campfire. Hi, thank you for listening. My name is Ron Phillips, and I'm the owner and operations manager of Talk America Radio. It is with great pride that I offer you this 24-7 stream of some of the finest talk radio programming in the country, but I need your support. We are a listener-supported network. That means we need your help to continue to offer the quality programming you're hearing right now. If you're able, please visit TalkAmericaRadio.us and click the Support Us button. Your donation will go a long way in helping us continue to share the American voice. Thank you. 
Hi, it's Mark Walters from Armed American Radio. You know, for nearly a decade, I've been educating, informing, and entertaining responsibly armed Americans. And during that time together, we've shared some ups and downs, haven't we? Trump's election saved our Supreme Court, and no doubt the future of our gun rights for now. But now is not the time to lay down. The enemies of freedom are well-funded and more determined than ever. To keep up with the state of your gun rights, make sure to tune in to Armed American Radio right here on Talk America Radio, the new dominant voice in conservative talk radio. Donna, you know, I sure miss listening to Neil Bortz every morning on my drive into Atlanta. I know what you mean, Don. Talk about appointment radio. Neil Bortz was the morning jolt of reality and political incorrectness that millions of people needed to start their day. You're so correct. When Neil retired, I seriously felt a major void in talk radio. Well, no need to feel that void now, Don. Neil is available on demand with his exclusive and completely unfiltered podcast called Sportscast. That's right, Donna. Neil no longer is faced with dealing with the FCC. His Sportscasts are unfiltered, politically incorrect, common sense. Think of it as Cowboy Logic Radio on steroids. No, think of it as Neil Bortz on steroids. I do stand corrected. Neil Bortz on steroids. Ladies and gentlemen, go to connectpal.com slash Bortzcast and find out why Don and I are faithful subscribers to his podcast. Donna, it's only $4.99 a month. $4.99 a month. Chump change. To once again, listen to Neil Bortz, my radio hero. He's my radio hero, too. Go to connectpal.com slash Bortzcast right now. Sign up and experience Neil Bortz again like never before. Connectpal.com slash Bortzcast. Sign up today. This is Don Newen, co-host of the Drive Time Sit Rep. Join me as I call in to my intel analyst, Denise Simon, for my daily situation report, or Sit Rep, the Drive Time Sit Rep. Check TalkAmericaRadio.us for more information and show times. You're listening to your local news source, WLBB, News Talk 1330 and FM 106.3. Hey, everybody, they're back on again. Cowboys didn't dance, didn't wear designer shirts. When their hearts were filled with memories, their bodies filled with hurt. They would sit around the campfire and exchange a piercing glare. Welcome back to Cowboy Logic Radio. I'm Donna Fiducia, along with Don Newen, and he's mouthing his radio I'm puking miming. of... Oh, I'm Don Newen, but he's behaving today. I am miming radio puking. He's, he's behaving... Not many people have that gift. No, especially in radio, because or nobody skill, knows what talent. the hell you're doing, because they can't see it. Yeah, but i got to so tell you, Donna, I am thrilled about our next guest, because mm-hmm. this is one of our favorite. It this is. is a guy that is the go-to guy, the go-to person, so I can be... Can, you know, Canadian politically correct. Canadian? The go-to person. Oh, yeah. okay. What's the guy's name in Canada? Trudeau? Trudeau? Okay. Everybody's Justin just a Trudeau. person. Oh, Nobody oh. has any gender. Oh, so he's not the go-to man. No, no. Oh, I Can't see. Can't be the go-to man. That's okay. politically incorrect. Sorry about that. And uh, Justin Trudeau would not like me for that. No. Like, I care what Justin Trudeau What brought up thinks. Justin Trudeau? Nothing. Okay, but Michael but Cutler... we're talking about immigration. He is the go-to man when it comes to immigration. Man. That would be Michael Cutler. They don't have secret agent person. No, they have secret agent man. <laughs> and that would be Michael Cutler. Yeah, sort of. Mike. All right, you uh, are... Mike, you've got a uh, pamphlet coming out. With the social contract, we'll talk about that in a minute. You've seen him on Newsmax, folks. You've seen him on most of the cable channels, in fact. Front Page Magazine and David Horowitz's Freedom Center. Michael Cutler has 30 years, 30-plus years of a distinguished career with um, the Immigration and Naturalization Service. Wrote for Laura Ingram's Life Set for a while there. He's testified before Congress, the 9-11 Commission. I mean... There's nobody that knows more about immigration than Michael Cutler. And with what's going on, especially in California, Michael, we had to have you back on. Not to mention the fact sure. that you do a show on our network as well. The Absolutely. Michael Cutler Hour. That makes and sense. nobody, ladies and gentlemen, knows more about Michael Cutler than 
Don Newen. <laughs> Back there to you, goes. Donna. There, there it is. It had to come out. And you can read all of Michael's stuff still on michaelcutler.net, correct, Michael? Absolutely. Okay, yes. so tell us about, first of all, this pamphlet you've got coming out with the social contract. And I guess sure. people can find that on uh, all the usual places, although I hate all to plug Amazon, but I will. Yeah. And Jeff Bezos, but, uh, that commie lib that he is. But uh, tell <laughs> us about it. Well, you know, I wrote an article by the same title for the Social Contract Quarterly, and it was so popular and so many people wanted to see it that the editors over there said, you know what, let's take this. And it was a big article to start with. It was 20-odd pages. And we're going to do a pamphlet, purely a booklet, purely on the issue. It's called Immigration Fraud, The Lies That Kill. Uh, because if you look at the 9-11 Commission, and, you know, I've arrested terrorists in my career as an INS agent, and what most people don't realize is immigration is such an important element for national security that the second largest contingent of law enforcement personnel assigned to the Joint Terrorism Task Force are immigration agents. And so that was why I came to refer to this as the lies that kill. The terrorists who have attacked us, and not just on 9-11, but the commission looked back 10 years leading up to the attacks of 9-11, found that at least uh, two-thirds of all of those foreign terrorists committed visa fraud and or immigration benefit fraud, got political asylum, got citizenship by lying about material facts. And we've seen that happen since then. Think of the Boston Marathon attack, the Tsarnaev family claimed political asylum, which means that they have a credible fear that they can never go back to their home country. They would face persecution or worse. As soon as we gave them political asylum, they hopped on airplanes and went back to Russia. Clearly, they committed fraud. That means, uh, you know, again, immigration lies that kill. I think it's self-explanatory. But we went into another issue with immigration fraud. Um, Usually, as an agent, we confronted two types of fraud. Fraud documents, fraud schemes. The guy that has fake ID or counterfeits an ID or does a photo substitution. And then the person that gets involved with a fraud scheme, which is, for example, getting involved in a marriage for money where they don't live together. It's purely to give the alien a green card and a pathway to citizenship. But there's a third form of immigration fraud nobody ever talks about. And it's the lies of the journalists and the lies of the politicians to deceive the American people to confound their understanding of the immigration issue, and we took that on also. It's that important. All the talk about the Mexican border, and I don't want anyone getting exercised, we have to secure the Mexican border. This isn't an either-or, though. We have to be able to rub our bellies and pat our heads at the same time. Uh, You know, I wrote an article for Front Page Magazine. I called it Border Security and the Immigration Colander. The notion that if we simply secure the Mexican border, that all will be over and then the problem is solved is as crazy as saying that if you plug one hole in the bottom of a colander, you've turned it into a watertight vessel. And, and, you know, for all the talk about how big the wall should be, how high, how many layers, how much electricity should run through the wires, uh, listen, if you give somebody a green card or you give an alien U.S. citizenship, That wall can reach above the atmosphere. It won't matter because you're giving them the key to the front door. And we've naturalized terrorists. In the past, you've said something that I think really tells it the best. It's like a a balloon. You squeeze it on one end, it pops out on the other. Exactly. And and I've also continued with the aviation uh, idea. I compare a secure Mexican border to the wing on an airplane. Certainly without the wing, the airplane doesn't fly, but the wing by itself goes nowhere. So a secure Mexican border is one element of a number of elements that must be put into place, and the quicker the better if we're going to protect the country. And by the way, I have to make one observation, because it's just been rattling around in my feeble brain. When you were talking about Canada and no one can be called a man or a woman, ladies and gentlemen, oh my gosh, there's a word that's emerging, and I want everyone out there to think about this, maybe over the next couple days. The word is disruptive. When I went to school, if you were disruptive, the principal would call your mother or father to come to school to find out what was wrong with you. Today, if you look at the high-tech industries in particular, everyone is saying, oh, this is wonderful, it's disruptive. I really am concerned because language has impact. This could have come out of the George Orwell Ministry of Truth. Oh, absolutely. You see, it's one thing to say something is revolutionary or a game-changer, But why are we being told to be happy when something is disruptive? Just something for you to file away, and we'll probably talk about it in the not-distant future, because I'm seeing the use of language emerging that almost seems to be designed to soften us up for God knows what might be following what what lunacy we're experiencing now. What do you think of that for an idea? Well, Michael Cutler, I think it is a great idea, 
and I would reference many of the the uh, chapters in the brief yet poignant book by Saul Alinsky, Rules for Radicals, uh, in which that word is used often. Mike, let me ask you this, uh, and full disclosure to the listeners, you have been a lifelong Democrat, and Correct. I want to ask you two things. Number one, I'd like you to address sanctuary cities and how the Democrat Party is getting away with embracing individuals that are here illegally and pr- offering them protection and benefits that American citizens like you and I that may differ on uh, political sides of the aisle don't receive. That's the first thing I'd like you to address. The second thing, sir, is that there was a, um, a governor of Colorado, Richard Lamb, that many years ago made a speech in which he described what he would do if his objective was to destroy America. And much of what we're seeing right now, he laid out in that speech, including immigration, including labeling people as racist and homophobics and and, uh, not wanting to create the melting pot. We don't want a melting pot. If we're going to destroy America, we'd rather have a tossed salad. There's no, um, there's no desire to assimilate. I mean, this everything that Lamb talked about and everything that's going on with these sanctuary cities, at least in my opinion, after knowing you for a lot of years and, and following your work closely, as well as just being a darn good friend, this has got to go against every bit of of DNA in your body. It does. And, and so let me start out by saying this. I know you're a political conservative, and I'm not. Uh, I'm a Democrat because I'm a labor guy. The Democratic Party is no longer the Democratic Party. So let's, let's start with that. Um, how could you be pro-labor, which is what the Democrats used to be, when you're allowing millions upon millions of Americans to be displaced by foreign workers, by bringing in workers from third world countries, workers from third world countries bring with them, in addition to the suitcase containing a change of underwear, uh, is the notion of third world wages and third world working conditions. And when you have enough third world workers willing to work for those third world wages and under those third world working conditions, that then becomes the new norm for the United States. You know, so you in would other think words, that we're making the United States an s-hole. Pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. And... and you know, it's interesting. I don't always agree with Donald Trump, and I wish he was more nuanced, and I wish he would stop tweeting when he disagrees with the attorney general. He needs to have a conversation with him, not, not share it with the world. But when he used that term, he wasn't describing the people. But this is the lie that's being told, and this is not about political correctness. Let's be very clear. This is Orwellian. George Orwell understood that as human beings, we think in words. So when you can eliminate words from the vernacular, then you eliminate the, thought, the thoughts the words represent. If you want to control thought, control the language. And that's what we're seeing, the Ministry of Truth, right out of 1984. I know you talk about Saul Alinsky, but if you want to really read something that I think at least gets to the heart of it as well as anything else, it's 1984. And by the way, in 1984, it was the middle class that was most feared because they had the intellect, the education, the understanding of issues. And in 1984, it was the middle class that came under the highest surveillance and scrutiny. And today we are decimating the middle class. And if you don't believe it, think about the purchasing power you no longer have that you did have maybe 20 or 25 years ago. Yep. When you have car commercials telling you how you can rent your own family vehicle to someone else to help you make a car payment, uh, let me tell you, the middle class is on the endangered species list, and it's not an accident. And, in fact, what's what's interesting is immigration is is what's disrupting everything, to use that word. You know, one of the things that's gratifying, I just wrote an article for Front Page Magazine, and it was called New USCIS Mission Statement Puts Americans First, Making America Safe Again. USCIS is an agency no one talks about. Everybody knows about ICE. Everybody knows about the Border Patrol. USCIS, United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, is the agency that adjudicates applications for immigration benefits. That includes granting political asylum, providing green cards, allowing aliens to become students in the United States, even providing citizenship. There was recently a couple of articles that I wrote about terrorists in the United States, one of whom came from Saudi Arabia. Think about this. We admitted him in 2011, 10 years after 9-11. No one realized it, but when he applied to take flying lessons six years or five years later, 2016, in Oklahoma, his fingerprints came back, because you have to be printed now if you want to take flying lessons. 
he actually had participated in terror training in Afghanistan in 2000 with at least four of the 9-11 hijackers, and here he is in Oklahoma taking flying lessons a year and a half ago. Uh, the possibilities keep me awake at night. Maybe he's no longer a terrorist, or maybe he's looking to fly so he can carry out an attack, or maybe there's more like him and they're looking to replicate the 9-11 attacks. Now, that's bad enough, but understand that we've naturalized terrorists. The Justice Department released a statistic that since 9-11, and not even going to current date, because I'm sure the number would be higher, I think going to 2016 or 2017, 148 naturalized United States citizens went on to be arrested and successfully prosecuted for committing terror-related crimes. That's how important the work of USCIS is, and nobody talks about it. By Mike, not having enough. Ask you this. It seems, though, that every major terrorist attack has been because of um, failures of our law enforcement, the FBI, the CIA, immigration. I mean, it's it, not failures of the agencies. It's failures of the top and the corruption that's in the top right. brass well, let's, of let's, these let's, agencies. Let's, well, let's, let's, let's slow down a little bit and, and be clear what we're dealing with. You remember they always told us that we have to be right 100% of the time to be safe and the terrorists only need to get it right once. Correct. Yeah. Understand that there are 6 million applications being adjudicated every year by USCIS. 6 million. If you have a 1% margin for error, which in most industries is acceptable, except perhaps the airline industry, uh, you'd say that's not bad. But 1% of 6 million, and we're dead. And we don't have enough agents to conduct field investigations. You have a president who apparently is willing to provide unknown millions of illegal aliens with lawful status. Every single application is potentially a gun aimed at our head. Understand that on 9-11, 19 hijackers caused more fatalities than did the entire Japanese fleet at Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. We're playing Russian roulette. Now, what I found, Absolutely. Now, what I found... Hold on, hold on a second, Mike. Hold on one second, though. Good. I want to go back to sanctuary cities. We haven't talked about sure. this. Why are Democrats fostering and fomenting sanctuary cities and offering protection and benefits to people that are here I are illegally? Can't answer that question. I can't answer that question. I'll tell you why I can't. These people are parents. They're grandparents. They have families. And what's left out of the mix, and I think that this administration has a horrendous, horrendous communication problem. Because if I was uh, Tom Holman, the, the acting director of ICE, if I was Jeff Sessions, I would be out there. And, and I think Tom is a good guy. Everything I've heard from my friends is he's a good guy. But goodness gracious, go back to the 9-11 Commission report. You know, I, I provide a testimony to the commission, as you pointed out. First and foremost, immigration was the reason, or failures of the immigration system were the reason that these terrorists were able to enter the United States in the first place and then embed themselves, hide in plain sight, and go about their deadly preparations. When you have people able to enter the United States knowing they would get safe haven in any municipality, aids and abets, induces and encourages aliens to enter the United States illegally, which under federal law is a five-year felony. And when the law changed in 1996, and I had worked with the council over at the House Immigration Subcommittee in preparing part of that law, each individual alien that you shield or harbor or aid, abet, induce, or encourage is a separate and discrete crime with a five-year penalty. So when you have the mayor of Oakland say, well, I'm law-abiding, you know, my mom, may she rest in peace, used to say self-praise is no recommendation. No, she's not only not law-abiding, what she's doing is treasonous. She's undermining national security for the entire United States of America because if you create a safe haven, and it's remarkable that if you look at what happened after 9-11, whether you want to talk about George W. Bush or even Barack Hussein Obama, they said, we're going to eliminate all the sanctuaries where the terrorists are hiding. Well, they were talking overseas. But neither Bush nor Obama understood, or at least publicly acknowledged, that we've created sanctuary for terrorists in the United States. We've created uh, training camps. There's training camps here, they know. There's training camps, but there's also places where these folks are able to go about their day-to-day -day lives knowing that no one's going to interfere with them. And if you look at the 9-11 Commission report, immigration fraud was the embedding tactic. Oh, Let me you're ask providing you one thing, though. Now, you, you referred to the law changed in 1996, and we've had people on the show lately that have said that had good intentions, like many laws do. But here's the problem then. Back then, before 96, 
uh, immigration immigrants could come back and forth freely across the Mexican border, you know, so they go home in the winter and they come back and, you know, through to California and do whatever their lettuce picking is you know, or mowing the lawns, as Nancy Pelosi says. Well, then in 1996, when that that kind of uh, came to a halt and they had to pay. They, uh, that's when the coyotes... What do you mean? I don't understand, I don't understand what you're saying. Uh, in 96, weren't there, there were some tariffs or something put on that, that no. gave rise no. to the coyote system? And so no. what the, what, no. well, okay, no. so, all right, no. then I'm in error then, because what, no. what I was... No, what, what they did was they tightened up, they tightened up on the idea that if you were, had committed a felony, that you become deportable. And I don't know if I even agree with all of that. You know, you have a guy who's been living in the United States for 30 years, he's now a school teacher, he's married, he's got four kids... He goes to naturalize, and they find out that back when he was 18 years old and attending college or wherever, he was caught with two joints in his back pocket. Now he's being deported. Yeah, but it gave rise to the coyotes, and then what happened is people started... Well, no, what gave gave rise to the coyotes was NAFTA. Okay. That's even... All right. Well, all right, but the point is, so then they decided if they're going to have to spend all this money for themselves to come across the border and, and back and forth, they couldn't afford it, they're going to bring the whole family in then. And this way, I only have no, to pay were always, for it once. Always, they were always trying to do that. We've always had a problem with the coyotes. NAFTA was, was the issue, by the okay. way. Okay, all right. Uh, because once we drove Mexican farmers into bankruptcy, they no longer could stay on their own land. They headed north because they had no other way to support their families. Okay. Well, right. Trump so wants it's, to renegotiate it's, it's directly, that. Let's it's directly hopefully re- that, and, that's why, and that's why Trump is right for going after NAFTA. Mm-hmm. And, and meanwhile, you have people like Ted Cruz, whose wife was on this Council on Foreign Relations task force to try to take down the borders between the United States and Mexico. Look, this is lunacy that we're getting from both sides of the aisle. You have the Goodlatte bill, which yep. doesn't call for more immigration agents, but would allow people on H-1B visas to have a quicker path to getting green cards so they'll be here permanently, and you'll wind up with more American programmers being displaced by foreign workers. Both How do you explain the- Debbie Wasserman Schultz and the Pakistani guy and his wife, who worked for the DNC, made I hundreds of thousands it. of dollars, I, and they look, catch him on a plane? You know, she yeah, got away. He didn't. I mean... Yeah, but... I can't, but I, I can't explain it, but how do you explain Bob Goodlatte doing what he's doing to destroy the computer industry? Maybe it has something to do with the fact that his son started with Zuckerberg at Facebook, and he's a major player in exactly. the computer industry today. Hey, let, Look, me, let me run something. Okay, let me run something real quick past you. And, let me just, and, I want to make this point, Donna, please. Okay. We have a conflict of interest in the Congress. Mm-hmm. You have people, whether it's Bob Goodlatte or it's, um, um, I'm trying to think of her name, Zoe Lofgren, uh, on the other side, she was chairman of the House Immigration Subcommittee. Bob Goodlatte is chairman of the House Judiciary Committee. They're both immigration attorneys. <laughs> and so understand that there's a conflict of interest. When you vote for legislation that pays for legal fees for illegal aliens, this isn't about pandering to the illegals. People say to me they're pandering to the illegals. You don't pander to illegal aliens. They're powerless. This is about making certain that lawyers get paid. Yep. There's a conflict of interest, and it's coming from both sides of the political aisle. And as Americans, you know, you talk about the war that's going on in America today. We have got to stop fighting among ourselves. You're Republicans. I'm not. I'm a Democrat. We're very good friends. We agree on many issues, and we disagree on other issues. That's what the First Amendment is about. But when we as Americans fight with each other, we're ignoring the chicanery being pulled by both parties against us. They're not representing the interests exactly. of the American we people. Are, at least I was a Kennedy Democrat, and I believe the right, same with you. What that's I why I've become a Republican, because the whole country switched to the left, and even that's too far to the left for me. Let me throw something at you. I there. happen to be a Frederick Douglass Republican. Yes, that's true, because well, that transcends go. race, which is even that. better. But let Let's me ask, not debate that, though. Hold on, but let me ask you this, and I found this to be really profound, and it's what makes Rush Limbaugh what he is today, and I'm going to give him credit where credit's due. So why he's been able to do this for 30 years. Let's look at the reason why the Civil War started. It started because of slavery, and a lot of people say, well, that's not necessarily the case, but the South wanted cheap labor. How is that any different than California wanting cheap labor? It's not just California, though. This is across the board. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce is the reason that we've expanded the visa waiver program from 26 countries on 9-11 to 38 today. There should be no visa waiver countries. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the American Immigration Lawyers Association, a whole bunch of industries. In fact, the Chamber of Commerce partnered with the hotel, hospitality, and travel industries to create the Discover America Partnership, and they brag about how they are determined to remove visa requirements when the 9-11 Commission said tighten up the visa situation. So what they're more concerned with at the Chamber of Commerce is how many heads are on an airplane or in the baseball stadiums than how many bodies are lying in the morgue. And as long as that equation doesn't change... 
And, and you know, what's interesting, because I try to find good news somewhere, I wrote this article for Front Page Magazine. I hope everyone goes to frontpagemag.com or my website, michaelcutler.net. But my article about USCIS, the mission statement, they used to talk about being customer-oriented at immigration. And when I went before the Senate Judiciary Committee five years ago, and I doubt they'll have me back because I've been hammering both sides of the aisle as I just did today, and I don't care that people need to have the truth about what's being done, not for them, but to them by their own government. Uh, look, I said that Doris Meisner, who was the commissioner of the INS under the Clinton administration, thought that her job as commissioner was to naturalize the world. She even hired people to speed up the production line. We were naturalizing people before fingerprints came back, 1.1 million aliens. And a lot of those hard workers at Citizenship and Immigration Services, or back then it was the INS, went to Internal Affairs and said there's corruption in the system. They identified thousands of aliens who should have been deported. Instead, we gave them citizenship. And I said she kept going around saying we need to be customer-oriented. She seems to have forgotten that our customers or the customers of our government should be the people of the United States. Well, there's it's a Democrat new direction voters. now. That's what it is. It's Democrat no, voters. No, it isn't. Is you see, line. you keep saying these things, and that's not at all the case. You're missing the point of the exercise. And okay. This is why the American people are fighting with each other. It's about cheap labor. And look, the contributors are giving equal money to the Democrats and the Republicans. They've all been bribed, and they're pumping billions into it. Gates has put over a billion dollars into this. So we need Same to drain the swamp, Zuckerberg. is what you're saying. Hey, look, Mike, well, though, we only got a minute, and I want to get to right. your social, the social contract, your pamphlet, Immigration Fraud and the Lies That Kill. Uh, sum it up, then, and uh, where people can find it, because we only got about a minute left. Well, it, it, it's not out there yet. It's being published. It'll okay. be at the social contract, and it'll be on my website, michaelcutler.net. But I, all I want people to do right now for this weekend, what is available, frontpagemag.com, new USCIS mission statement puts Americans first, would that the re- legislation being proposed in the Congress match what they're trying to finally do with citizenship and immigration services? Our government is supposed to serve the American people, and we should be the priority, and we're not because we're getting the best government money can buy every time there's an election. Freebies, free stuff, and I'm sick of having to pay for everything and uh, getting It's not the freebies. People. Again, it's the politicians being bribed. I know, but it's but, our money. It's, a ta- it's like the taxpayer money is their money. Right, and that's, and what that's why comprehensive off. reform would have taken taxpayer money to provide free lawyers so that the lawyers got paid. This wasn't to help the illegal alien. It was to help the lawyers, and yep. half of the Congress are involved with immigration so law So we practice. need to drain the swamp. That's the pro- you know, I yes. hate to say it, term limits, because people are too stupid. They keep voting for the No, I, same term congressman. limits should be imposed in the voting booth by the voter. That's yeah, my belief. Yeah, I know. But, I know, but it doesn't happen. Well, Michael when you have good Cutler, people in Congress, you don't want to get rid of them. So, yeah, that's you know. true. Like Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right, Michael Cutler. Well, Chuck Grassley is a good <laughs> guy. My friend Lou Barletta is now running for the Senate. Absolutely, yes. I love Grassley, too. Okay, the social contract, immigration fraud, the lies that kill. Look for that on uh, com- upcoming on michaelcutler.net. And again, read all of Mike's stuff uh, at Front Page Magazine. You've seen him on Newsmax. You've seen him actually on a lot of the news channels. And also yeah. the David Horowitz Freedom Center. Michael Cutler, the go-to guy for immigration. And also look for his show on talkamericaradio.us, folks, because he does his own one-hour show talking about what we just talked about, and that would be immigration. And, Mike, I always end the show with a uh, saying, this one from Mark Twain. Honesty is the best policy when there's money in it. I think that kind of <laughs> sums it up, don't you think? Well, my, 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 my famous saying that I used to give the uh, bad guys when I was about to start an interview or an interrogation was there's only one version of the truth, don't forget it. <laughs> exactly. Well, Michael Cutler, thank you so much, everybody. That does wrap up another Cowboy Logic show. Find us at cowboylogic.us, talkamericaradio.us. We will see you next week, and in the meantime, God bless America. Cowboys didn't dance, didn't wear designer shirts. Check us out on the web at cowboylogic.us.